I'm going to talk about a paper that was written many, many years ago by uh, Richard Hamilton, who you may recognize from inventing the Ricci flow, which was used to uh, prove the point for a conjecture. Um, and Natasha Shesha and Todi Despolis. Uh, they studied what's called an ancient solution to a geometric flow called the curve shortening flow. So the first thing that, there was a lot of words there. So geometric flows are understood to be processes where some geometric object in space evolves some property. Now, in our case, our geometric object is a curve, and the property that we're evolving through time is the arc length and the curvature. So we're seeing how our curve changes as we flow it in time. So I guess to move on, what is the curve shortening flow? So suppose gamma is a curve mapping from some interval 0 to t. Crazy can be look, can look like that. Um, I do mean curve. So suppose that this is a family. Suppose gamma is a family time dependent curves on the plane, um, such that. Our initial conditions, so at time equals zero, our initial condition and our initial position is embedded. When I say embedded, I just mean that it's an injective differentiable function between differentiable manifolds. So you can just think about it as like if you've stuffed it into a plane, there's no self-intersections, there's no like bad points basically. Um, okay. So one thing that we need to understand, just a general notion of is curvature. So from Cal 3, you guys have a you guys remember like kind of like if you're looking at a circle, curvature is one over the radius. So what we're looking at here, we're gonna call kappa t comma x. Um, mean curvature. Um, with respect to the normal unit vector. So if you've seen some geometry before, we're saying that this is the trace of the second fundamental form. But all that really matters is that when you see this, you understand that if you're looking at a curve, it's how twisted it is, how far away it is from being a straight line at a given point. So the way I've kind of structured this talk is that we're going to do some background with partial differential equations, and we're going to look at some parabolic PDE theory, and then we're going to look at studying these ancient solutions, which I'll tell you what they are in a minute. Okay. So if you've taken ordinary differential equations, you know that you can find some unknown function of one variable that satisfies this relationship between the derivatives plus some initial condition. It's called an initial value problem. With PDEs, it's exactly the same. You want to try and find this unknown function with some sort of initial conditions. So. The initial value problem, I repeat, for the curve shortening flow is the following. We take the time derivative of this family of embedded curves, and it's going to be exactly proportional to the negative, negative curvature times the normal unit vector, um, with an orientation chosen so that your normal vector is pointing outward. And then you take some initial condition at time, whatever, at position zero. So your initial position of the curve, and we call that gamma naught. Okay. 
So for the remainder, we're going to say let capital gamma of T be the solution to the IDP. parabolic PDE theory so that I can give you guys kind of an idea of some of the techniques that we would use to, to approach a PDE like this. So this is very important. Um, you guys see up to like here I guess. Um, okay so we'll start with the definition. important 
is that parabolic PDs have a uniqueness condition.
maximum attained by this function on the boundary of our parabolic cylinder. So this tells us that if we know where our maximum is just at the edge case, we know where it is on the whole domain. And the next one is the strong maximum principle. So the strong maximum principle then says if u is connected the top, in the topological sense and there exists some point x0, t0 in our parabolic cylinder such that our solution function evaluated at this point attains a maximum. So we're just saying that we have our maximum inside the domain.
So now we understand how heat flows behave. So what we want to see is a curve shortening flow which kind of describes how um, arc length of a curve will evolve over time.
So just pictorially, um, theta, this is our x-axis or t-axis or whatever our horizontal axis is at a given time. If we have some curve, say it looks like this, and we're looking at our tangent vector here, if we were to extend it, we're looking at this angle theta. You see as if we move along the curve, our angle is changing. So it works as a nice plan. Uh, so then if theta is our angle between the tangent vector and the x-axis, then we get the following evolution where we want to study how this angle is changing. So then we get d theta dt is equal to negative kappa ds and d theta ds is equal to kappa. Okay. So the way that we want to prove that this is true, that if this um, piece evolves, we're going to, for the first relation we need to use a, uh, something called the Frenet equation. Or actually, no, for the first one we do it with uh, writing it out in components, and then the second one we use the equation. But that's kind of just general outline. I guess I have enough time. I guess I can go back and prove this, because that's pretty straightforward. I guess now instead of saying just believe me that that evolution of curvature is true, I'll have to show it. So the proof of that is just that kappa dt is equal, using this parameter here, second derivative of theta dt ds, the mixed partials, is equal to the second derivative of theta the mixed partials. Circle. 
So we're just trying to say the optimum way to take some fixed piece of string and wrap it around an area. Gauge and Hamilton prove that if you have a convex curve, it will become a singular point. 
you have that any closed embedded curve shrinks to a single round point under the curve shortening flow. So this is kind of like our segue point into what an ancient solution is. So an ancient solution to a geometric flow, in our case of CSF, called an eternal solution, meaning that for all time backwards and all time forwards, um, solutions exist. Now, you may think, well, if we can solve this PDE going forward, can't we just put in negative t and get what happens going backwards? Not necessarily, because parabolic PDEs do not have the same symmetry as elliptic PDEs do. So heat flow does not have the symmetry where you can just flip time, hence why these solutions are very, very different from ones that go forward. So, also, there's a, I guess, twin to this, where you start at some finite time and go to um, if positive infinity, and those are called immortal solutions, I think. So, we want to go back to our parametrization with respect to theta, that kind of like nice PDE that was strictly parabolic that we knew how to work with. Um, so, it's very useful to consider something called a pressure function. That name comes from physics. I don't know where in physics, but um, it's kind of like studying it's this uh, monotone functional that has nice properties and also makes our computations a bit easier. So, when we're considering evolution of curvature to look like this, Define our pressure to be P is equal to um, kappa squared. So then the PDE we ultimately want to work with is the time derivative of pressure which is equal to this product. And even though that looks worse, it does make the computation easier. So then we have two classifications that are going to look really ugly when I write them first, but I'll give like a picture after that. So under the curve shortening flow, we say that solutions that exist for all time going towards negative infinity are called type 1 solutions if the following is true. small 
smaller and smaller until it becomes a single point. And then type 2 solutions correspond to something called unbound opals. solutions are called the Grim Reaper solution because when they come into contact as they're translating with other functions it annihilates what it comes into contact to so like it kills what it hits like the Grim Reaper. So I learned that at a conference last week so I just kind of was using the name haphazardly and I also my guess before was because these solutions look like this um, they look like half of an Onganon oval I was like well if you kind of like Look at the y-axis, it kind of looks like the side that the Grim Reaper always has in cartoons, but that was how I was justifying it to myself, but there's actually a reason for that. Um, do, do these curves yeah. follow anything in infinity, or do they have yes? So these are translating horizontally. Um, well, I've drawn this backwards. This is T going to negative infinity. Horizontally. Oh, okay. They start at some finite time. As you go backwards, they move horizontally. But technically, they have not closed curves, right? Right. So that's why our original theorems about like convex embedded curves uh, and closed curves mm -hmm. going to a singular point fails with these solutions. Okay, okay. These are why they fall under a different classification. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. okay. Um, they're also non compact solutions. So, I guess overall the proof 
of the compact solutions relies very heavily on uh, analyzing something called the opponent functional. And the non-compact solutions come from a very geometric argument. Now, why I think this is interesting is because you have the same initial differential equation, and you have the same goal in mind, but when you have this compactness condition, it's a very analytical argument. You take away compactness, and all of a sudden, it becomes a very geometric argument. Um, with that, since I only have like 10 minutes, I'm going to go ahead and prove to you the existence of the Ankanon oval solutions, and pretty much that's what I'll have So, for the existence of the Ankanon ovals, we want to look for a solution to the pressure evolution, and with some like very smart choices, we know that this know that the solution is going to be of the following form. You're going to try and identify a solution that looks like this. I definitely didn't think of this. I had to read it about seven times before I actually knew where it came from. Okay. So then, the first thing you want to do is you take the time derivative of pressure. So you're just looking at A prime, so then, same vein, we also have the, the derivative with respect to this special theta parameter is going to look like negative 2 B of T sine of theta plus C cos of theta plus C. We also needed the second derivative with respect to theta. So then we plug all of these pieces into the pressure evolution, which I erased. Um, and we end up getting kind of a nice-ish looking ODE, this behavior we've been studying. Um, we end up getting that our pressure evolution looks like this. We get A prime of T minus B prime of T. This side is equal to negative 2 times A T. Then we use the fact that this has to hold for every theta. So that tells us then that our B prime of t has to be equal to zero, which implies that our B of t has to be some constant. Then again, we make a smart choice to say we're going to choose theta to be such that sine of theta plus this constant c is equal to zero. And this is okay to do because it holds for all theta. Um, and now we're just left with a prime of t is equal to negative 2 lambda a of t plus 2 a of t squared. So now you notice we've gotten rid of b, we've gotten rid of all other functions and all other parameters. We're only looking at a function of t, so this is just a, er, a function of t, so we're just looking at an ODE. We're just looking at a single variable ordinary differential equation. Using regular methods from ODE, we solve for a of t to be equal to a parameter lambda <coughs> 1 minus e to the 2 lambda times plus d for some other constant d. Um, and you can keep lambda positive, d is just real. Okay. So then we go back, put everything into our pressure functional. And then we take our limit. This time goes to negative infinity of p of t. Theta t. To 
give us that this goes to negative infinity. So this implies that d has to be equal to zero, um, which then gives our final solution the pressure function being equal to this 1 over 1 minus e to the 2 lambda t minus sine squared theta plus c. Now if you remember, we parametrize like four or five times to even get to this. So we go back and we unparametrize, and once we unparametrize things, we end up with um, the solution family minus of t is equal to x comma y, such that cosine of x is equal to e to the t hyperbolic cosine of y, which then, if you were to go plug this back into our original PDE, it satisfies our original PDE. solution, you need like a bunch of like patching of domains, and I can't draw that on the blackboard very well. Um, so yeah, we have our complete classification of ancient solutions for the curve shortening flow, which includes shrinking circles, stationary lines, the Amgenon ovals, and Grim Reaper solutions. And then there's more geometric flows that behave similarly, but are obviously much harder because we're, we're no longer just dealing with curves. For example, there's the mean curvature flow where we can, where we take the time derivative of mean curvature of surfaces and other higher dimensional manifolds. And then there's also the Ricci flow, where you're flowing the Riemannian metric. And all of them follow the sort of like parabolic ish behavior. So I think they're very nice to study. That's it. Thank you. if you have um, you actually have a vertex in the card. Oh god, I had that question the last time I gave this talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's it, it smooths out or you end up with a really bad singularity and you have to end up you have to do like the singularity blow up analysis, but I actually don't know. Okay. I should, probably should have figured that out when I was asked it last time. I didn't know. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> I wish I could give a better answer, but I don't know. Which I found that being in grad school, I learned to say, yeah, I have no idea. A lot easier than I did when I was in undergrad. <laughs> Any more questions? 